Yeah. I'm not sure it's really six o'clock. Is it? Is it? Oh, delicio. So, buonasera and a real warm welcome to you all, especially in a winter evening like this one. Um, I'm Dina Panetta, the director of the Italian Culture Institute in Melbourne. And um, we are all here now tonight to launch uh, Honorable Tim Fisher's book, Policy and Holy Me, 1000 Days in Rome. It's uh, a great honor for me to host this event. And um, it's also really a treat for all of us because uh, the book has just been published, I believe, yesterday. So it's the only launch, I've been promised, the only launch in Melbourne is here. So we are very fortunate. And so today we can actually buy the very first copies of Holy See and Holy Year. Um, and I wish also to thank uh, Sir James Gobble for being here to officially launch the book in a very, very few days. And I take this opportunity also to thank uh, Sir James for what he did a few years ago, I believe in 1974. Thanks to his good advice, the Italian government bought this beautiful building out here. Oh, bravo. And, um, yes. for six months now and uh, I really love this building. It has character and um, it just needs a little bit of care with the help of everybody. And um, let's go back to Ambassador Tim Fisher. I was lucky enough to be in Rome, working in Rome, when he was uh, the first resident uh, Australian ambassador at the Vatican. And I was uh, lucky also to enjoy his company, his family's company and friendship on so many occasions, official occasions and unofficial occasions. So it's uh, again a great honor to have you here. And um, what a person, what a wonderful person Tim Fisher is, is something that I don't need to stress perhaps. But to me, it seems that he has had so many lives already. And I have to actually read the, uh, the list because he was war veteran from Vietnam, politician, Leader of the National Party, Minister, Deputy Prime Minister, Farmer, Writer, Envoy in his team up, and then Ambassador to the Holy See. I really, I do admire his energy and uh, the dedication to whatever he does, but also, also as a writer. I'm really looking forward to reading his book. And I should stop here because are, we are all eager to listen to a description of his 1,000 days in Rome very soon. So let's welcome Sir James Gobble to um, move the officially uh, launch the book. It's my pleasure to uh, welcome particular guests here, this is of course to our, our important uh, author who you'll hear from soon. Um, but also we have present the Honourable Richard Alston, former Senator for Victoria, Cabinet yeah, yeah. Minister for, for the High Commissioner. And, uh, <laughs> I think we have present the very Reverend Canon Richardson, former representative of the Archbishop of Canterbury to the Holy See. Uh, and, and, and I was present last night when he launched uh, uh, an equally fascinating and interesting book, namely a book by Gerald O. Collins, who's here, and uh, and I, so I'm, I'm nearly launched out, but not quite. <laughs> <laughs> then we also have John Richardson, Director of the Victoria State Office of the Department of Foreign Affairs, uh, former Ambassador Geoffrey Bentley, uh, was Ambassador to to Russia, <coughs> and Professor Ed Whistle, who's the Director, Chief Executive of Melbourne's Royal Botanic Gardens, and I think he's just back from a stint in, in Kew, so, and uh, we might request his aid to, to help restore these beautiful gardens that are here. Uh, actually, uh, uh, being reminiscent about uh, this place uh, uh, makes me reminiscent also about a a function that some of you would have been at. Uh, it was much, much warmer than, than tonight. It was a very hot night, and Gough Whitlam 
was delivering a very learned address on the influence of the uh, of the Italian stay of of the romantic poets on the body of English literature. Now it wasn't exactly most of the audience were Italians. It was a very very hot night, and Goff has never one to cut speech short. <laughs> <laughs> Conditions, and he, I think he was standing at that end, and the audience were all around here, and quite a number were standing, and these windows were all open, uh, these French windows, opening onto the garden. And Goff, uh, I think, spoke for something like an hour and 20 minutes, <laughs> and, uh, and by the time he finished, he had a, a rapt audience of one himself. <laughs> These Italians had gently slid off into the garden at the side. Goff was not abashed one little bit. It was a triumph, I thought, of perseverance. So I hope, uh, I'm sure it won't happen to me tonight. Because we're all, you're all trapped in there. Uh, well, we have, there are two important features which more or less guarantee the success of this book. The first is that the book is centred on Rome. And the second is the personality of the author. As to the first, uh, Rome is a setting that can seldom be surpassed, especially when discussing the value of an ambassadorial post. Uh, Rome is, after all, the historic centre of what was once the greatest empire in all time. Roman Empire. And everywhere you turn, Rome, the city, is still redolent with that history. Equally, if not more importantly, in the year 300 AD, Rome became the home of Christianity. And so much of the story of Christianity continues to be played out from Rome. All this is powerful enough but it becomes even more persuasive when one considers that the cultural uh, richness of Rome that, that is so uh, evident. It's sometimes said that Italy holds some 25% of the artistic patrimony of the world. Uh, if this is true, then much of that patrimony resides in Rome. As to the second guarantee of success for this book, namely the personality of the author, that's evident in so many ways. Uh, the author recites somewhere in the book that he, he wrote a diary every day, uh, which is an extraordinary feat uh, when I think of when we read all the various things he had to do um, and the, the events. Uh, and it requires enormous self-discipline to write a diary of that kind, of that type. This uh, kind of record may not appeal to some people. It's not written as a diary, but it's founded upon a daily diary. Uh, but historians love people who keep diaries. I mean, it's the grist of which research is truly made, rather than people who, who uh, write from their recollections, half-formed on... Uh, the mists of time and, uh, and uh, <coughs> influence, of course, uh, by the fact that one forgets the bad, uh, the bad memories and remembers only the good times, or at least most of us are like that. Um, but the, uh, it, it's also valuable because it enables people to understand the interplay of personalities. And one book that uh, is I thought of when I read Tim's work that I went back to was a, a famous book by Sir Alan Chadwick on Britain and Vatican in the Second World War. It's out of print now, but it's an absolutely riveting book. I've read it about three times. And it tells the story of uh, Sir Darcy Ellsborn, who was the British ambassador to the Holy See during the war. And there was only a handful of ambassadors who were allowed to stay. And, and the, all the pressures and tensions that went on uh, are, are graphically described. And I think that uh, 
Osborne's papers were very complete, he wrote very complete uh, records under difficulties, getting them to England and so on. But uh, it's, it's, it just shows you the wealth and the richness of the flow. And it's very relevant, that book, because of the, the chapter on anti-Semitism that, that appears in, in Pip's book. Um, in the early chapters, uh, one of them is called Why Me for Ambassador, um, the author sets out why Prime Minister Rudd chose him. His qualifications were extensive, we've already heard of that. I noted his reference to his being comfortable with Vatican II and especially the ecumenical pathway of Vatican II. Now, uh, that's often forgotten that ecumenism was a, a key component and a new component so far as councils were concerned. And uh, it's, it's good that we remind ourselves of that because without doing so, we tend to leave the Vatican documents there. They're a brilliant source of information, of teaching, of encouragement, of invitations, as, as Gerald put it, Gerald O'Connell's put it in the recent uh, lecture he gave. And, uh, and I'm delighted to see that Tim picks up this point about the ecumenical pathways that were opened up by that council and which we're doing something about slowly but surely. Uh, Ambassador Fisher dispels the myth about uh, alcohol and, and the diplomatic life, at least in Italy, because I'm very sensitive about that, having been brought, having had an Italian childhood where wine was always on the table, but for kids of my age, I was seven when I left Italy, uh, was wine and water. And Italians grow up with this notion that wine is not something that you abuse, that you use as a, as a wrecking vehicle. It's something that's there to accompany food. And, uh, and it's lovely to see that, that uh, uh, Ambassador Fisher has, has noted that and what's more, he got on to a, a, an area which is absolutely fascinating. Uh, he makes the point that uh, it's a case of Prosecco rather than Champagne. Very pleasant, but half the way. The Prosecco is marvellous. I know that, uh, that uh, fishes don't live uh, in the King Valley, but right now in Australia there's a revolution occurring. Prosecco, which is a wine that's drunk 24 hours a day in northern Italy, especially in Venice and the Veneto, uh, has hardly been cultivated at all. And recently I helped send a, a young man called Valzotto, whose father came from Val de Biadine, and he went to the vineyards to the uh, wine school. There's a great wine school at Vardo Biadine. And, uh, uh, and, and he spent the time of the, uh, at the time of the uh, Vendemia, the harvest. And he saw the grape being brought in and the Prosecco being made. Now he, part of the terms of his scholarship was that he was to share his knowledge with other people. And he did uh, in, the, in, the, in the King Valley. Now, he's selling Prosecco, which is, I think, as good as most Italian Proseccos I've had. Brown Brothers are now selling Prosecco. It's Cini selling Prosecco. It's now going to be called the Prosecco Way in King Valley. And there are all sorts of things happening there. All of that's come from, you know, one young man goes there and comes back with an idea. So, uh, Prosecco is, is obviously caught on with the ambassador. And it's great to have a plug for a new, a new bit. Thank you very much for that. Um, well, let me turn to one of the chapters that I found uh, uh, particularly worthwhile, namely that headed Who's Who in the Vatican. There were many interesting insights about the agencies that are located in Rome. I, I knew there were quite a number of them, but I didn't realize how important uh, some of them were. In particular, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, known as FAO, FAO 
which has been there, I think, uh, since the war. It's been there a long time. A very important agency and very much tied in with the Vatican's concern uh, through its nuncios around the world with issues of, of, uh, of, of food security, issues of famine, issues of hunger, and so on. And, uh, and that's very well described in, in that chapter uh, because uh, we, uh, one of the issues, for example, uh, concerns uh, <coughs> crops, uh, GM crops, international trade practices that deny third world countries basic markets. Uh, our ambassador was very good about running with those issues and how well equipped he was, of course, because he, as a former trade minister and as a farmer, he would be right on top of all of that. Uh, at one point, he points out how impractical some of the cardinals were in their discussions, uh, especially the descriptions of what he describes as nostalgia <coughs> agriculture. Now, uh, it, this nostalgia agriculture um, is described in these terms. Uh, Senior Curia personnel believe that somehow farming in the 21st century would be best if it reverted to small lots and a kind of cottage farming carried out by extended families and using local markets. One cardinal was adamant that this was what people really wanted and further that farming was best done on an organic basis with no fertilisers, no chemical sprays and no big machines. In a perfect and population stable or shrinking world, this might just work, but I do not think so. <laughs> How direct and positive that was. So much for no nostalgia agriculture. The author describes also the Vatican Department, uh, the, the array of different departments, as a series of silos whose, which function quite independently of each other. And he records uh, how one modernist, Monsignor, attempted to lay down a series of key performance indicators. And it was greeted with apoplexy by his staff. <laughs> and it just made no progress at all. Uh, one of the interesting points he makes is a very simple one, but a very powerful one. He contrasts the quasi-democratic process of the conclave uh, to elect the Pope with the holy monarchical power thereafter enjoyed by the Pope in respect of every aspect of government of the church. So in no sense is there anything except other than an absolute monarchy. There is no, there is no real uh, participatory feed in. Uh, it's, it's every piece of law has to go across his desk. Uh, it's true, as the author points out, that when uh, appointments of bishops are made, three names are put forward, but one suspects that the three names are put forward in a certain order, and, uh, and, and in any event, uh, it's his say, and uh, you immediately ask yourself, well, what happened to the original idea of, of, of the collegiality of bishops and uh, of the apostles uh, uh, having uh, being involved in the, in the government of the early church. Um, so there's a real challenge raised by uh, that piece of writing and I commend it to you. Uh, the author is critical, though in a restrained and diplomatic way, of the poor use of media. Uh, for example, he points to the publication of one particular uh, uh, encyclical. Uh, Pope Benedict XVI uh, and his most senior Curia personnel, he also writes, put a great deal of energy into the 2009 papal encyclical Caritas in Veritate, Charity and Truth. It was released to coincide with the G8 meeting in Aquila on the 8th of July, where the 2008 global financial crisis was to be a, a top priority. But there's not a shadow of doubt that it came about a week late. It had been widely signalled well ahead that such a letter was in the pipeline. It was coming. 
coming, got delayed, got further delayed, problems emerged, uh, and was getting the necessary translations right. It was clear, the author writes, that the Vatican and the Pope have decided, we've got all these leaders coming, this is our take on the failings of the modern world that have led to this massive global crisis. But even for it to have been in the briefing, briefing papers of the leaders as they headed to Aquila, it would have needed to have come out at least a week earlier. Most of the leaders were landing in Rome on the day it was formally released. And the media launch plan for the encyclical was, as usual, essentially non-existent. There were no patrol strategic leaks, leaks no phalanx of cardinals briefed and ready to step up in each of their locations to endorse and explain the encyclical. No special one-off interviews by the Pope with, say, CNN or BBC. It was as if Caritas and Veritate should stand alone, drawing attention to itself purely on merit. That's a fairly critical, but seems fair, description of, uh, of the failure to make use of modern media in an important document like that. Uh, most interesting, too, was the description of the reach of the Vatican into overseas countries through its 140 papal nuncios, each of whom send back letters full of uh, valuable insights. I was once told that uh, this made the Vatican a unique repository of some very valuable information, uh, in much the same way as the old Venetian ambassadors used to send material back to La Serenissima, it was all gathered together. But there it was used uh, very much uh, for commercial and, and, and political purposes. But uh, our master points out in his book that um, it's very difficult to tap into that information, at any rate at a senior level. Uh, that's a pity, uh, if that's so, when you think of all that ability and all that information that's coming back. Uh, the most absorbing chapter for me was a chapter headed anti-Semitism in the Vatican. Uh, the author devotes a whole chapter to this topic which relates to the criticism uh, uh, following the Second World War, indeed some of it during the war, that Pope, Pope Pius XII failed to use his position as Pope to denounce the Holocaust and fail to assist Italian Jews. Uh, the authors carried out a valuable analysis of the Pope's conduct. He writes that the greatest criticism of Pope Pius relates to the arrest of some 1,000 Jews living in Rome who were dispatched on a train to Auschwitz, and only 15 of those, that 1,000 survived the war. There were, in fact, about 8,000 Jews in Rome. So the the others were spirited away and they were not uh, were, were saved. But the uh, fact remains is that uh, uh, and the criticism is that why didn't the Pope, it was known that this was happening, they were being rounded up, they were taken to the Stazione Tadmini, why didn't the Pope go to the station and publicly pray uh, on the occasion of the loading up of these people? What harm could have flowed from that, and if there had been harm? That's the question that, is, that the, the author doesn't ignore and deals with it. However, he puts some facts forward which are important. Uh, he says, for a start, there was a big split within the Jewish community in Italy, and many Jews were pro-fascist and anti-communist, while others were anti-fascist and anti-communist. There was no real unity, and without unity, communications and strategies were less than perfect. Uh, overlying this was an instruction from Mussolini that Jews who had fought briefly in World War I, when Italy was on the side of the Allies, but in the main with disastrous generals, would be exempted from any labour restrictions or other anti-Jewish measures. And this helped to create a false sense of security. Another fact was that there was an order from Pius XII to open up the convents and monasteries, as well as Vatican City itself, to those fleeing the Nazis, particularly Jews. And it could be said that ultimately the Nazis 
extermination policy was a failure in Rome since about 7,000 of the 8,000 Jews, as I pointed out, escaped into monasteries and convents and, and so on. And, uh, and then there was a great uh, contribution made by a whole uh, number of institutions and, and bodies. Uh, uh, after examining this material, uh, the author writes, my conclusion is that the Holy See and its head of government, Pope Pius XII, took action that led to the rescue of thousands of Jewish people from the Nazis. Could he have done more? Uh, he says, this will always be debated because the Pope failed to prevent one train load, that dramatic departure of, uh, I think it was 1943, uh, from Rome for Auschwitz. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a topic that, that uh, will be continued to be discussed. Uh, I'd like to refer to one experience I had that bears out uh, a point that the author makes, and it's this. Uh, in 1987, we were preparing for the bicentenary in Australia, and we were, the Italian community was putting together uh, through the Italian Historical Society at Kaiser in Melbourne, uh, a, a, a substantial exhibition called The Italians <coughs> in Australia to cover the whole of their period there. And, and we were looking for material, and uh, I was in Rome, and I had a, a belief that there was a map, a famous map of the world, uh, going back to 1604, known as the Mappa Mundi Ricci, by the great uh, uh, Jesuit missionary who went to China, um, which, was, uh, which had a, a, the earliest, clearest depiction of a portion of Australia. And I thought, what a wonderful thing it would be if we could get hold of this map, find out where it is, and borrow it. And uh, in my innocence, I was went up with Shirley to the Vatican Library and asked, uh, could I see the Mappa Mundi? And the little senior sent me on my way very quickly. Um, and he was not at all uh, sympathetic and it didn't matter that I'd come all the way from Australia as I pleaded. Um, but uh, walking by just at that moment was the prefect of the Vatican Library. I think he was a Dominican uh, you might remember, Gerald, was it Father Boyle or yeah, yeah. Boyle? And he heard this little uh, uppity Monsignor and he intervened and he said, is there anything I can do to help? And I told him my story. Uh, and he said, yes, we do have the Mappa Mundi here. And he said, as a matter of fact, I've been here seven years and I haven't seen it myself. <laughs> <laughs> That's typical. <laughs> I, said, well, um, uh, I said, but I'll arrange come back uh, and uh, have it brought out. It's, uh, it's a very delicate map. And I, and I he told me, he showed us around the library, and my wife was a librarian, she was very interested, and all these, we asked uh, how long does it take to get a medieval manuscript uh, up from the stacks? Uh, and he said, uh, 20 minutes. And we were very impressed with that, how come? And the uh, the prefect of the library said, well, we're very lucky. During the war, we sheltered a, a great many Jewish scholars here, and they spent the whole of the war cataloguing the library, which had been a mess for a, a long time. And as a result, uh, this, we can get our hands on a manuscript, you know, in 20 minutes, <laughs> like that. So we, anyway, we came back after lunch, and he, he spread out this wonderful, map, which is uh, uh, the map of Mundi, the map of the world, of all the known world. And, uh, and it had there the tip of the Gulf of Carpentaria shown. Nothing else, because it was all unknown. 1604. Only two copies in the world, one in the Vatican Library and one in Kyoto. Uh, and uh, and uh, he said, look, I couldn't possibly lend it. It's very frail. You can see it's on rice paper. But it was as white as the driven snow after all those centuries. And he said, but I'll, I'll arrange for photographs to be made and you can make full use of them and take the negatives and use them. 
as you see fit. So it was a 